Okay, our next speaker um, will be Mark Saxer, who is the resident director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Institute. He has a background in political science and law. He's written fairly extensively about issues of politics and corruption in Thailand, um, although he has written um, for several publications outside of Thailand as well, um, as well as for regions other than Thailand. And anything else? That's it. And with that being said, let's go ahead and start. All right. Uh, uh, welcome everybody, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to speak at Tamasat University, really. Um, we have a very strict moderator and uh, beforehand I already uh, told him that I try to be as Germanly efficient as possible, but I think now that we are lacking behind in time, I have to switch to German robot style, really. <laughs> so, what I'm going to talk about right now is basically the interconnection between economic development and political development, which really cuts both ways. And I think uh, this is the very essence of a transformation crisis, one of which you can see here live in action in Thailand. Basically, what I'm going to argue is that socioeconomic and political development are intertwined. Uh, of course, you know the argument of the modernization theory that strong economic development will put uh, a lot of pressure on the political order, but I'm going to argue that it's going to cut both ways, that uh, if a society is not able to solve a transformation crisis, this will also undermine the economic innovativeness and uh, basically the growth potential of society. So let's start first, because every q and A are always going to be in, there's always the answer, isn't Thailand so unique? And I know some one of you had that question already, and so let's just start the other way around, and I'll tell you why it's not. Um, basically, this is a, a list that uh, Joshua Kulancic from the American uh, Council of Foreign Relations put together in his book, uh, The Global Revolt of the Middle Class. It's a series of crises that you can see over the last uh, 10, 15 years um, that pretty much looked exactly the same as what we've been seeing in Thailand. Uh, over the last 15 years, over the last 10 years here. Actually, that uh, list is even not comprehensive. There's many more countries. In the order of time, just have a look at it and appreciate how many countries are, are on that list, and it's actually more than that. Um, there is some sort of a secret script uh, to these countries, uh, to these crises, these campaigns, these street protests, which I try to lay out to you in order to put everything into perspective what's actually happening in Thailand right here. Uh, what you see in all these countries is, of course, so strong socioeconomic development over a couple of decades. Uh, most of them, except uh, the countries of the Arab Spring in the first wave, have actually developed some sort of a liberal democracy a while back. Uh, in Thailand, that was, of course, the 1990s with the 1997 uh, liberal constitution. Um, so basically, what's in order with all the deficiencies and defects of this democracy, there is an electoral regime. So the people can actually choose their leaders by themselves, and they are making active uh, use of that, of that right. So in all of these countries, you see what I call very neutrally a clever political entrepreneur coming on the stage. That can be a Bolivar socialist like Mr. Chavez, that can be an oligarch friend like Mr. Yanukovych, that can be an Islamist like Mr. Erdogan, or that can be a neoliberal tycoon like Mr. Taksin. Doesn't really matter. What these political entrepreneurs have understood is that you can win election, that you can build a new power base based on catering to the hopes and needs of the emerging a population in the countryside, because that is actually the sociological effect of, uh, of development, is that you have uh, what Andrew Walker calls, you know, politicized peasants emerging middle classes in the countryside. Here in Thailand, of course, that would be the region of the north and northeast, but also in the south. Um, the problem is this. Once these people get elected, they behave what Kulanchit called as elected autocrats. So basically what they do is they behave according to the political culture, uh, and that political culture is basically a patronage culture. What does a patron do? You reward your supporters, you favor your kin, you protect your clients, you distribute the spoils, you cut out those who do not support you, and you crush your enemies. 
So that's basically what a patron does in all of those countries. The problem is this. The middle class in the, in the capital sees that as a fallback in the most vulgar times of corruption and nepotism. And even more, the middle class becomes the permanent minority in this new electoral system. Because uh, if you look from Turkey all the way to Thailand, um, the old establishment parties have never learned to reach out to the majority population, which is why they lose one election after the other. So the political vehicle of the middle class and the old elites is not able to play the electoral game. To their terror, they find themselves in a permanent minority and they also feel threatened because these elected autocrats are pushing very hard uh, what was called here an iron fist in a, in a velvet glove um, against the constitutional safeguards for the minorities. They are pushing against the uh, uh, opposition, against the media, against civil society. Most of these people are middle class people. So the middle class feels threatened, but it cannot change anything with the electoral uh, cycle. We'll come a little bit later to the discourse level, how this actually plays out. And I will argue that what the middle class perceives, and it doesn't matter if that's right or wrong, it's a discourse uh, which is very strong, for instance, here in Bangkok, that we are robbed by corrupt politicians who buy the votes of the greedy poor with populist projects. That's the middle class fear discourse. And this fear discourse uh, becomes ever more terrifying the more authoritarian the elected autocrat behaves. So in their desperateness, the angry middle classes um, start protesting and team up with the old elites in order to overthrow the elected autocrat. Happened in all of these countries that I show you before. Fun thing is, some of them survive. Mr. Thaksin did twice here in this country. Mr. Chavez did in Venezuela. They come back on the electoral ticket. So basically, it didn't really work out with that coup, uh, no matter how hard it was played. So Mr. Ian Brammer adds a little bit of empirical evidence to this more anecdotal evidence um, here, and that's the so-called J-curve. Uh, it basically works like this. If you look at the patterns of dozens of countries, which includes uh, the uh, trajectories of Western uh, countries uh, 100 years ago, but a lot of countries right now, it, it really looks like this. Uh, basically, if you start opening up a country, you know, liberalizing the political order, stability very, very quickly decreases. Um, and only after um, the um, prolonged conflicts have been resolved through a social compromise, stability slowly, 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 gradually, gradually begins to increase again. In other words, a transformation is a rough ride um, and where things can get really messy uh, at the bottom of it. So the challenge for society, uh, for every developing society, is to get through this rough patch as quickly and safe as possible. So this is why it makes sense uh, to look into what transformation crises really are and to understand that these transformation crises are actually what's really going on underneath the surface of the political conflict, underneath the circles, for instance, in Thailand, of the red-yellow conflict. So what is that, a transformation crisis, and how can societies overcome it? A transformation crisis basically occurs when a society uh, changes very quickly without adapting its political system to a new social reality. So let's have a look at how economic, cultural, and social changes work together in to overstretch a traditional uh, political system, which creates deep crises of legitimacy. In a way, you can say transformation crises are victim of, their, uh, of the society's own success, because they have seen decades of economic growth, which have created a modern economy. However, such a modern economy is not only bigger, but it's much more complex than an agricultural economy. Providing the necessary infrastructure and public goods for a complex economy requires a highly effective governance system. Traditional governance systems were built for a different time with different needs. So they are hopelessly overstretched when catering to the needs of a complex economy. I think that's what I want to put out there. The first structural change that we have to keep in mind um, 
that are happening underneath the surface of the political conflict is, uh, and they're eroding the traditional political order, that's complexity. Complexity is the first structural driver. The second uh, structural driver is diversity. Uh, in a complex economy, a society is fragmented in a way. In a cultural economy, if you think of it, it's relatively simple. Right? You have uh, uh, warriors, monks, merchants, uh, and uh, craftsmen and farmers, and that's about it. It's not a very complex society. It's not a very diverse society. Right now, if you look outside the window and see modern Bangkok, you have yoga teachers and web designers and, and whatnot. So I think new lifestyles uh, create new interests, uh, create new worldviews, and they differ. Um, so what's happening is that you have a pluralist society, uh, which naturally has more noise and conflict uh, than an agricultural society. So conflict becomes not the exception, but the norm. So basically, the political culture, which are centered around notions of unity and harmony, uh, uh, are perceiving this kind of diversity as decay. And conflict it can be perceived as social and moral decay. So the second structural change overstretching the traditional order is diversity. The third one is conflict in itself, the permanence and the magnitude of social conflict. The economic and social development creates losers and winners, obviously. And new middle classes emerge in the provinces and demand equal participation in political and social life. The established middle classes in the capital may see these demands as a threat. So along with the traditional elites, they're not prepared these citizens as equals. The result is a long drawn out social conflict over the political order. So this social conflict, this crisis of social justice, is the third driver for the erosion of the traditional order. Structurally, it looks like this. Complexity, diversity, and conflict work together to erode the old vertical society and create a more horizontal and fragmented society. This is the point when these long-term trends become a practical problem, not only an academic one, the top-down, exclusive kind of backroom, old man in a backroom decision-making processes of the old vertical order no longer work in such a society. So what's needed is a decentralized and participatory political order, which governs systems which are able to satisfy the needs and demands of a complex economy and pluralistic society. However, this question, which political system fits best, is not an academic one. On the very contrary, the core of a transformation crisis is a conflict, a political struggle between those who want to preserve the status quo and those who seek change. But a transformation crisis is more than just a power struggle on the surface over the control of the economy and the political system. It is a rivalry between worldviews. It's a clash between moral codes. It's a competition over what is the truth. A transformation crisis shakes the very foundations of a society, questions identities, I think that's very important, and disrupts traditions. It's a polarized, emotional, and sometimes explosive conflict over the fundamental question how people want to live together in a society. So in order to tackle these and many more challenges, the political operating system needs to be upgraded. The governance system needs to be able to process more information. This is the problem of complexity that I mentioned, which means that you have to include more stakeholders in the decision-making process. A basic mechanism is to the needed to determine who has the mandate to make decision. My opinion is that only elections can create this sort of legitimacy. Safety valves are also needed, on the other hand, to limit majority rule to the rules of the game. So only a system of checks and balances can create these boundaries. So basically my argument is only democracy has its necessary power sharing and mediation mechanisms to tackle all of these challenges. Of course not all people would agree with that. So some of them think that it's safer to create uh, stability with a quick fix. That's what you call a coup d'etat. 
So basically what they're doing is they're creating stability by undoing the opening process and closing the system again. So uh, that may indeed short create short-term stability. It's exactly what we're seeing in Bangkok right now. You know, it's uh, the image is that everything is quiet and stable. However, that doesn't work in the long run because the structural changes that I mentioned continue to work. And they will continue to cripple the political system and choke development. So sooner or later, society will come at the same crucial crossroads again where there is a necessity to open up the political system. The pressure to open up is not theoretical. This is not something that we only discuss here in, in, in this room at this honorable university. It's very practical because it's driven uh, by practical problems which cannot be tackled with the old tools. How can you satisfy the growing demands of public, for public goods by the emerging middle classes in the countryside if the established middle classes refuses to pay taxes? You know, remember what I said, the discourse were being corrupt by corrupt politicians to buy the votes of the greedy poor with populist projects. That means the middle class in the capital is not prepared to pick up the tax bill for development. How do you deal with the demands for greater participation and political rights if traditional elites do not accept all citizens as equals? That's the Buffalo discourse, basically, right? How do you process the vast amounts of information needed to store a complex economy when only a few people have the authority to make decisions? That's the back rooms with those old men. So basically, in order to resolve the transformation conflict, a society needs to renegotiate the social contract. On a political level, that means you have to adapt the political order to the new balance of power. On a social level, it means to address the crisis of social justice, which is the very root of a transformation crisis. Social justice defined as the gap of opportunities and life chances between those at the top and those at the bottom of the society. Equally important to the content of this social contract, by the way, is the way how it's agreed upon. This has to do with the nature of institutions, and I think this is one of the main problems in Thailand. Uh, rules are nothing but a piece of paper if they are not agreed by all sides, that these are the rules that you want to live in. So I think, how many constitutions did you have in Thailand? 20 or something. This constitution writing, this institutional engineering doesn't lead to anything if it doesn't create the social consensus of these rules. If they are imposed from the top, they will be resisted from below, which make them ineffective. I'm going to speed up a little bit, but unfortunately, if that wouldn't be already enough to completely fundamentally overhaul the political order at the very same time, you also have to completely overhaul the economic system. Because that success that I was talking about, those 30 years of strong development, is facing new developments from all angles. Of course, you have the global financial crisis, which hits an economy which is such export dependent as a Thai economy very, very hard. On the other hand, that low wage, cheap labor model creates exactly the social problems um, that uh, we are having right now. And at the other side, you have, have an energy crisis because fossil fuels are coming to an end and climate change will be a bigger problem. So, to address the crisis of social justice and the transformation crisis, a new development model is needed. What that means in practice, that a lot of fundamental changes in policies need to be implemented quickly, consistently, and comprehensively, and this is the very problem. That's the actual challenge. Not all in stakeholders have an interest in change. In fact, many of those benefit from the status quo and seek to uphold the old order. Political change is the outcome of a struggle, not of academic institution building. It's the outcome of a struggle between those who benefit from the status quo and those who uphold the old order. This means policy shifts cannot be implemented only on the basis of technocratic advice. What is needed is a societal change, is a coalition 
who is able to master enough political leverage, muscle, to break the resistance of the status quo coalition. Hence, those who build this democratic society have to create the political muscle to prevail in this struggle. And this is a little bit leading us into what I call the vicious cycle of transformation. Um, basically, if a society doesn't overcome this transformation crisis quick enough, uh, what is happening is there's more and more conflict. So the political system gets frozen, paralyzed in a way. I think that's pretty much exactly what happened to Thailand over the last couple of months. The political system gets frozen, which terrifies, again, at least the middle class, but actually the entire society. All this conflict and all this noise and all this bickering, and it's so bad for business. And a lot of people feel very uneasy with that. Because most people have invested their identities in this world that they've been born into. And suddenly everything changes. The role of the father in the family, the role of the boss in the factory, the role of, I don't know, the godfather in the village. All of these things change overnight in less than one generation. So a lot of people do not only benefit from the status quo in terms of status and privilege and economics, they also benefit, they, they're invested in it when it comes to identity. So that makes it really complicated and hard to make all these fundamental policy changes in such a turmoil. If you look at what happened to Thailand, is that 10 years, almost 10 years of transformation conflict have polarized Thai society. Thai society is polarized by fear. Fear of moral decay, fear of state bankruptcy, fear of state failure, fear of civil war quite astonishing for a society which will benefit more from the rise of Asia than any other on this planet. Actually, this should be the golden moment for Thailand, but the society is crippled by fear. What it means is that in the pragmatic and moderate center of the society, there is a, is a void, right? There's not enough people who stand up to uphold the political regime, which is democracy which means that the extremists can rule the day. The less moderates in the center are ready to fight for the, the democratic center, the more extremists can rule the day. This why, and that's a very interesting, I think, angle, uh, which I would say to the red shirts now, a majority is not enough. A majority can initiate a democratization process, but it's not enough to consolidate a democracy. Because if the middle classes and the traditional elites feel threatened, they will rock the boat and undo the change. So what is needed is a broad societal coalition for democracy which can marginalize the extremes and limit the power of the elites. And that is actually what really drives transformation because the real problem is the patronage system. The rest is just facade. If you cannot tackle the patronage system, you cannot couple, tackle corruption and sleaze and crony capitalism and nepotism. And patronage, again, is to reward your supporters, to favor your kin, to distribute the spoils, and so on. So it means it, means it is the abuse of power by the powerful. That means fighting corruption means to curb the ability of the powerful to abuse power, which means you have to empower a society, its citizens, and not disenfranchise them, which I think it's tragically ironic. What happened here is that those who wanted to fight corruption have actually strengthened the very patronage system which drives corruption. So, I'm almost finished. Um, Basically, how do you get out of this mess? And I think uh, if you look at many transformation crises around the world, a lot of society have managed to come out of this mess, even though it seems so overwhelming. So basically, if you need a broad societal coalition in the center, that cannot be formed without the established middle classes and the capital. And they may scream and shout, and you may not like what they have to say, but they have their grievances of the abuse of power and the endemic corruption. So you have to tackle that and take these things serious. This is why a social compromise needs to be based on a social, uh, social contract, needs to be based on a social compromise 
between all classes. How can that look like? Well, basically, the elites accept democracy as the only game in town. But they try to get an electoral mandate to govern by reaching out to the majority of the population. The majority of the population, on the other hand, accepted as limits to the majority rule, checks and balances, rule of law, but they get in return better life chances, full capabilities, almost finished. Yes. The middle class is somewhat crucial, not because they're very special or anything, but because they're tactically what makes the difference between the status quo and change. The middle class stays with the elites, the old elites, the status quo will prevail. If the middle class changes the side, change is inevitable. So that's why tactically we have to get the middle class back into the democratic flock. This is why I'm very interested in what the middle class is actually thinking. So if you want to break away from we are being robbed by corrupt leaders, blah, blah, and you want to go through that sort of compromise, what does the middle class get in return for paying the bill? Well, they get in return social peace, good governance, and quality public goods. That's the social compromise. And I would argue that a lot of countries around the world have overcome their transformation crisis I come from Germany, I think ours was the worst. I'm not proud of it to say, but I think we messed it up big time, right? So the question is how do you get out of it? And I think starting with Roosevelt's New Deal, these social compromises have been adapted all over Western Europe and more lately in Latin America. And I think what you see there is stable democracies, which at least as long as this social compromise was intact, actually also performed economically very well, whereas the opposite, if you create an atmosphere without a social compromise, then you will lose the ability to take those on board who fear change. And if you don't take those on board who fear change because their identity is threatened or whatever and they don't like it, then the society will close and it will lose the ability to politically socially and economically innovate. So for an upper middle income economy deeply integrated into the global division of labor, that is the ticket for survival. That's the middle income trap. The middle income trap is not just some economic thing where you hit the glass ceiling, is that you have to solve the transformation dilemma. The transformation dilemma has to be solved by a social compromise. So you can say if you really want to boil it down, the middle class holds the tax key to the social contract. And the social contract is basically the precondition that you can create a knowledge-based, innovative-driven society because it allows society to embrace change. And if you have exhausted extractive growth based on cheap labor and natural resources, that's the only thing that you can actually do in order to increase productivity is to invest in innovation. So that's my argument where I said this, it cuts both ways. Socioeconomic transformation puts the traditional governance system under stress, but if you don't resolve that, also your ability to continue to grow driven by innovation will freeze. Thank you very much.